Thank you, Mark. Children, if you're still here, you're dismissed. If you're participating in the Christmas program. Good morning, everyone. Great to be worshiping with you here this morning, especially on a, on a day where we celebrate communion together. I really appreciated the scripture that Mark shared with us from Colossians 1. And I was, as I was thinking through Colossians 1, it just kind of hit me anew how great a reminder it is of how Christ really is central to everything that we do here, both in our church, but also in our life on earth. I feel like it's so easy to read through some of the, some of the scriptures that we, that we go through on a weekly basis and kind of just hone in on that scripture and kind of focus on it. And then we kind of get bogged down in the message there, the instructions that are given to us. And sometimes I think we forget that there's a greater reality that all of it's pointing to. And that's the glory of Christ and what he's done for us. So I think being able to re-attune ourselves in, through the practice of communion really it, it helps to teach us who he is and it helps to glorify what he's done for us. And I think that's a really relevant message this morning, especially as, as we dig into our topic for the day. So as many of you know, we are going through a series on the gifts of Advent, gifts that Christ has brought us. And this week, we're going to be talking about joy. And I think that's something here that most of us here at least are a little familiar with, but the world's definition of joy oftentimes is very different than our definition of joy. I mean, looking around, we see that during Christmas time, we those words comfort and joy are plastered all over our media. You, it's not easy, or it's not hard, I should say, to turn on the radio or turn on the TV and hear a, a message of joy of some kind. You can listen to all kinds of songs like Have a Holly Jolly Christmas or We Wish You a Merry Christmas or The Bane of My Dad's Existence is Simply Having a Wonderful Christmas Time. He can't stand that song. But there's also hymns that we hear sometimes that are thrown about by all kinds of, you know, from all different sources, you know, like God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen or Joy to the World. We hear these, we hear these from Christian artists but we also hear them from secular artists. And I, I get the, the impression that the message that culture puts out is very different than what we might find in Scripture. I mean, culture likes to emphasize joy as kind of this warm, fuzzy feeling that we have on the inside when we're warm or when we're fed or when we're surrounded by family or we get a, maybe a good night's sleep or uh, we get off of work for a day. That's kind of the, the definition of joy that culture puts forth during Christmas time. Go out and be joyful. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. I think this definition kind of ignores what we, what we read in Scripture and what we, what we celebrate when we celebrate the Lord's table. And so I think taking some time this morning and celebrating the Lord's table and to remember Christ's body who was broken for us and his blood which was shed on our behalf to bring forth a new covenant. I think it really helps put into perspective that our joy that we have as believers is a little different than the world's definition of joy. Because as Kent pointed out last week when he preached, all of the gifts that we're exploring in our series, all of them are mediated through the cross. Where Christ was crucified in our stead for you and for me. And so I think that helps shape our perspective a little bit because there was a price to be paid for our joy. And so I think that kind of informs our decision. And I don't know if you've ever had that a moment in your life where you have a moment of joy, but there's also a cost that was paid. It changes our perspective a little bit. I remember when, when I was in my early 20s, my family went through a really rough time. My dad was put on workers, uh, or he was on disability. He was on workers' compensation for a while and he was disabled from his work. And what ended up happening is, you know, the, the usual tune, the employer eventually gets fed up of paying workers' comp, just cuts it off completely. And we lived on almost nothing. We were on food stamps. We were on, you know, whatever assistant we could, and it still wasn't enough. And I remember just the, the cost that was paid to our family in that time, you know, what it did to my parents, what it did to my siblings, what it did to me. 
And relief did come. God answered our prayers. And so we did have joy on that day when the decision came in from all the courts that said, you know, you're disabled. There's a lump sum payment there. But it changed us. And it kind of the joy that we felt was a little different than if it had come right in the beginning. So I just think it's a wonderful way that we can celebrate communion and remember the cost that was paid on our behalf. Let's just take a moment. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we turn our hearts to you this morning, I thank you for the powerful reminder that you've given us of your son's sacrifice to our practice of communion today. Father, as we read in Romans many times, all of us have sinned and we all fall short of your glory. Without an intercessor, none of us could come here in prayer before you today and none of us could stand in your holy presence. But in spite of all of our sins, Father, you are gracious and merciful. You have shown us mercy in dying on the cross for our stead. And for that, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts and joyful spirits. I pray that you would speak to us through your word this morning and through your spirit in the minutes ahead. Cultivate within us a spirit of joy and instruct us how you deem fit through spending time in your word. We ask these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Well, last week, Kent walked us through Luke chapter 2, the story of the shepherds and the angel. And I remember his message last week was that God is the stability of our times. Wonderful message. He's the source of our peace. And if you remember the story, the shepherds were out in the fields and they are uh, tending their sheep. And all of a sudden this angel descends from heaven and he brings forth a message. And I just want to touch on that message very briefly because I think it's applicable to what we're going to study today. The angel said to them, fear not and behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Last week, we used this passage to talk about the peace that God brings us. In these verses, though, we also see a message of joy, a promise of joy. If we looked at that previous verse, it said, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Great joy, wonderful. The Messiah's birth doesn't only bring peace to us, but it also brings us joy. And we're not going to retread all that old ground. We're not going to look at this passage anymore. But what we are going to do today is kind of look forward just a little bit in time. An undefined period, but pretty shortly after this message was preached, we're going to see part of this promise fulfilled. And we're going to do that by looking at the Gospel of Matthew. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 2, second chapter of the New Testament. And if you don't have your Bibles, I'll have the message up on the screen so you can follow along with me there. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 12, a message of joy. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." And Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. 
And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. I feel like this story needs no introduction. We've all heard this story in some way, shape, or form. The story of the wise men, I think, is one of the most uh, memorable stories in the Bible, partially because we look at it every year. I mean, there's been movies made about it. There's songs about it. Uh, Every children's play that I think I've ever seen incorporates some kind of snippet from this story, if not the whole thing in its entirety. When I was a child, I acted in a skit as King Herod, and that was a lot of fun too. We, there is, this is one of the most recognizable stories. And I think, you know, just reading through it, it was really interesting to me that sometimes we get a few details uh, kind of mixed up or we add new details. For one, we always think that uh, the, the wise men came to visit them in the manger, which if we read from verse, when we read from verse 11, isn't the case. You know, we, in our nativity scenes, we, always, we oftentimes have the wise men, but they visited Mary in, in a home in Bethlehem. Likewise, we like to think that there were three wise men And that's not specified in scripture, is it? There was three gifts. And so I I think over time, as a collective conscience, uh, people in the church, people outside the church just like to think that, oh, well, three gifts, that's one gift per wise man. I mean, I think nobody wants to be the fourth wise man not bringing a gift for Jesus. But the question I have is, what truths can we glean from our story today? I've recently been participating in a small group. Mark mentioned this already in Steve, Steve DeHaan's small group on Thursday evenings. One thing I really appreciate that he does every time we get together is he asks two questions about our text. The first question is, who is God? What has he done? But then the second question is, who are we in response to that? And so I'd like to explore very briefly those two questions. Who is God? And who are we in this story? So Matthew begins by commenting a little bit on the identity of Jesus. Who is Jesus in the text that we see today, according to Matthew? Well, verse 2 automatically, or or right off the bat, I should say, clues us in to who Jesus is. The wise men arrive, and they come seeking the one born king of the Jews. Now, that word born is really important because it implies that, like, Jesus doesn't become the king of the Jews at some point throughout his life. It's not like, okay, well, now I'm, I can somehow become king. Um, he is born that way. He is, that is his destiny, and it always has been. And I think part of the reason why Herod kind of gets really angry here, and he kind of is, is worried, is because Herod was not born king. And so when the wise men come in and they're seeking the one born king of the Jews, it excludes him because he was appointed king by the Roman government. So Jesus is the one who's born king. But it, the, the text doesn't just stop there. In verse 6, there's a quote from Micah chapter 5. Now, we're not going to turn there, but if you're taking notes and you want to write down where this quote is taken from, it's Micah chapter 5. But there's some development about who this king is. And if you remember, it says that king will be a ruler. He's going to rule over the people. But then on the other side, he's also going to be a shepherd. In the first case, being a ruler implies that he's going to act as a leader, using his authority and righteousness to rule over the people. The second aspect shows more of a, you know, shepherding is is more of about guidance. It's, It's a little bit gentler. Both of these are part of Christ's ministry on earth. But there's even a bigger reality from here because This passage is calling back to a particular king who was both shepherd and king. Do you remember who that king was? David. In in talking about how the king of the Jews will rule and shepherd, they're calling back to this, this idea that had been circulating in the Jewish consciousness, that had been prophesied in Scripture of a future king under David's reign. And I just want to share a couple verses from Isaiah chapter 9. We looked a little bit at part of this last week where where Kent read, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This had been a, a prophesied king that would come 
that would be all of these things, but he'd also be from the line of David. But a few verses before that, there's a message of joy that's thrown out there. I'm reading from verse 2 of Isaiah 9. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy, and they rejoice before you as with joy of the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. The point here is that Matthew, in, in all of this, these images, the idea of the, the shepherd king, of the, the king of the Jews, he's talking about this king has finally come. And with that is, a mess, is this message of joy. People are going to experience joy. And we see that in the early life of Jesus, in particular in the lives of the wise men in our story today. So here's my first point this morning. God is the source of our joy. I wrestled with this one a little bit because there's so much you could say about this, and I want to get more specific, but I think there's, there's several different ways that God is the source of joy in this story. For one, God provides the object of joy for the wise men, and that's Christ. And you look at the story and how it's, it, it's put together, and all of it is, you can see God's hidden hand in it. There's this star that rises that, that kind of shows these wise men that something is happening. That's from God. There's the fact that these wise men noticed the star. It was brought to their attention, and they, they have the knowledge of astronomy to go, this is something strange. And then they also had the knowledge somehow to understand that this star is proclaiming that the king of the Jews was born and they followed it. All of that comes from God. But even deeper than that, we know that Jesus Christ was sent by God to save people from their sins in the first place. And we see that confirmed when the, when the wise men finally find the baby Jesus. This is the source of their joy. And we see how they respond. But it's more than that, too. What we know from Scripture is that Christ's birth, death, and resurrection are a source of joy for us, but also God is the one who fills us with joy in the first place. Consider the word from Romans here. This is Romans chapter 15. He says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. I brought this up a few weeks back as a benediction, but we see in this passage that it's God who fills us with all the hope, or all the, the joy, I should say. And it's easy to skim over this benediction, but this is true, that when God's Holy Spirit lives in us, that's our source of joy. That's the one who causes us to feel joy in life. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit, according to Galatians. This comes from God. So, I know some of us here really do struggle with joy sometimes. The solution, so to speak, is not that we need to do anything necessarily. There's not some one action we can go out and go, okay, I'm not feeling joyful today. I'm just going to go out and do this thing and bam, okay, I'm joyful again. Joy is something that we cultivate, to borrow Kent's <coughs> words from last week. It's something that is already in place that we continue to grow and foster within us. We all have joy within us, or we ought to all have joy within us if we're saved and we have the Spirit of God in our hearts. I'll return to this in a moment of how to cultivate joy, but I want to talk a little bit about who are the, the wise men, and in, in, in conjunction with that, who are we in this story? First of all, the wise men, it's, it's, it, they're very interesting people. They're called magi. Uh, what, what's implied here is that these are Gentiles who have come to, to recognize Jesus' kinghood. I think that's really just absolutely shocking when you think about it because in Matthew's gospel, the, the, the first people who come and celebrate Jesus are these Gentiles. It's incredible. I mean, any Jew who'd be reading this would be shocked by this because Gentiles, they're not on our team. They're on the opposite team. You know, they're not supposed to come in and worship this future king of Israel. 
It'd be like me as a, as a Michigander supporting uh, Ohio State in any of the, the games that, that they play against Michigan and Michigan State. I mean, it, 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 it was shocking at this time. But what it does show is that that promise that we looked at in Luke has already started to come to fulfillment. That this is good news of great joy for all people. It's not just the Jews who are going to be the recipients of this blessing. It's all people. The text also tells us they come from the east. We don't know exactly where the east is. A lot of scholars like to think Babylon, but that's quite a distance to travel. It was farther than most people had traveled in their whole lives. And what the text also tells us about the Magi is that they rejoiced with a great joy. This is probably the, the most descriptive term we've, we've been given of their personality or who they are outside of the fact that they've come to worship. That's, that's all the text gives us, that their primary motivation is joy. And that, that phrase, great joy, we, it's kind of a common phrase we would use today, but in the scriptures, it's only used five times, that, that particular grouping of words, great joy. And the thing is, two of them are in Matthew and two of them in, are in Luke. I think what's really interesting is that we see one here in the beginning of Matthew and the next time we see someone celebrating with great joy, it's during the resurrection. Martha and Mary have great joy. And the same thing is true in Luke. The great joy that's promised with the, with the words of the angel, it finds its fulfillment at the very end of Luke when the disciples see the risen Jesus and they rejoice with a great joy. There's also all kinds of passages in Scripture. If you're, if you're taking notes, again, you can write down Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 and 17. It talks about all the different ways that people are joyful for the Lord. So the Magi, they come rejoicing. But what's interesting is the response from Herod and everyone in Jerusalem. You, you could just picture this in your head. The Magi run into Jerusalem and they say, where's the king? You know, we're excited. We're going to go and worship him. And everyone's like, what? Uh, the, king is, the king of the Jews, the promised one has been born? They have no idea. And what's more than that, they're troubled by it. They're not ready. And the wise men, the best part about it is they don't seem phased at all by this. They don't seem, it's not like they're discouraged because they look around and they see nobody knows. We look, you know, we, we have this whole thing of what's happening with Herod, where Herod gathers the people, the, the, the scribes together. He's like, where's the king of the Jews? You know, I, you know he wants to nip this in the bud. He wants to, to, to kill Jesus if he can. And the, the, the Magi, they don't, it's not like they, I don't know if they picked up on it or, the, or if they didn't, but they don't, aren't phased by it. They're still going to go through with their plan. And that kind of brings me to my second point this morning. Christ's joy is at odds with the world. The gift of joy that we receive from Christ is very different from what we see in our society today. We saw that in the story of the, the wise men and, and Herod. The wise men have this, a different kind of joy that's there that Herod just doesn't have. He's antagonistic to it. If we look at our society today, there's just so much that, the, that society likes to say that, that is joyful for us. I mean, you know, joy is found in safety and security is one that I've heard. Joy is found in doing what feels good for me. Joy is found in uh, maybe the latest technology that we find, the latest iPhone 7 or 9 or a million. I don't know what they're on right now. Joy is found in... in winning in a, in a game over somebody else or crushing our opponents. Joy is found in having a filled belly or a fulfilled sex drive. All of these aspects, though, are fleeting. This is what society says will bring us joy, but they're fleeting. If, if you have a really good meal, a Thanksgiving meal, a Christmas meal, in a few hours, you're going to be hungry again. Well, maybe the next day. It passes. 
the newest and latest greatest te technological advancement, it gets boring after a while. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, you know, I'd, I'd be so excited for Christmas Day. I'd get the thing I wanted, a Game Boy Color was the big thing. And I was so excited on that day. I played it for hours and hours, three, four hours, five hours. My parents were looking at me funny and saying, you got to get off that thing at some point. Loved it. By the next Christmas, I was on to the next, to the next thing. I was ready for the next thing. I was bored. I didn't have any joy in it anymore. Let's contrast that for what we see in Scripture in the wise men. They had made a journey of undefined length. They had followed a star, which probably seemed to be a little boring, if you ask me. You know, all day or all night, kind of just following the star. Maybe in the day, you kind of take a break, wait for the, wait for the star to rise again. They had taken a while. They had traveled a long distance. And they showed up, and they're excited. They're still excited. And they feel joy from seeing, from seeing the possibility of the Christ. And they arrived in Jerusalem, and with all the chaos that was going on there, all the uncertainty, they're still excited. For us today as Christians, our joy is even more complete than that of the Magi, isn't it? We know what Christ's death brought us and what it means to have the Holy Spirit in our hearts. I just want to quote really quickly from 1 Peter here. 1 Peter says, In this you rejoice, though you now though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the, the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here's the important bit. Though you have not seen him, you still love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. We have a joy that lives within us because we have salvation in our souls. In the Old Testament, when you look at the joy that's expressed, they express joy about relatively simple things, being saved in a battle, getting some kind of physical blessing or, or riches or food or a good harvest. But as you read through the Old Testament, there's this kind of theme that runs, that, that runs as, you, as you get further and further in it that the joy that's expressed is a little hollow because the problem of sin still remains. But now, since Christ has once for all dealt with our sin, we have the ability to fully express joy. Because in the end, there's a greater home waiting for us. There's a greater destiny in heaven spending time in the presence of God. What a joyful thought that is. Now, when you think about that, does that change how you, how you think about the world? How you about, think about things at life or how you express yourself? If not, my question, my challenge, I guess, for you is why not? So, I want to move on from there just to talk again briefly about how do we cultivate joy in our life. What did the wise men do when they found Jesus? In verse 10, it says they, when they finally reached the place, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And then what did they do? They came into the house and they worshiped. Here's my next point for you this morning. Worship cultivates our joy. <clears throat> the answer that we see in the text this morning is that when we've experienced real joy through God, we are but worshipers before them. The Magi could only follow the star. They didn't do anything except show up and they worshiped and were joyful. Yeah, they did give gifts, but th those gifts were just symbols of Christ's kingship, who he was the real king. They worshipped, they sacrificed some of their possessions, and then they left. Worship is one powerful way that we can cultivate joy in our life today. And I'm excited by the potential of, of at least closing it in another song of worship, one that we can, we can express our joy 
for what Christ has done for us, for the cost that has been paid, and the wonderful reality of a risen Savior and a Holy Spirit within us in the future. But there's one more wrinkle left in our story this morning. The wise men didn't just disappear from the scene without a little bit of commentary. If you look at verse 12, verse 12 says, And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Here's my last point this morning. The gift of joy leaves us changed. In other words, joy is transformational. The Magi walked away from an encounter with Jesus Christ, a changed group of people. They took months or more out of their lives. They dropped what they were doing. They probably had responsibilities. They left it behind. They followed the star. They showed up in this town, almost got themselves into some real trouble. They found the Messiah and they were joyful at it. And then they, they gave these, these really expensive gifts. And then they left. And we can see that they left by a different way. God in, intervened in their life and they were different. Here's 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Now, I don't know where you're at with joy right now. If you, are, if you struggle with joy, maybe some of you are probably a lot more joyful than I am. <laughs> Others of you may struggle with it a bit. But the point here is that we are changed because of our relationship with Jesus. And that joy that before eludes us, that we, we have no hope for the future, we now have that hope. We have that joy. We have the reality of a living Savior in our lives today. And that changes us just as it changed the Magi, just as it changed almost everybody who had an encounter with Jesus. You look at all the people he healed and they all walked away changed people. Because of what God has done for us, we are a changed people. And even though sometimes our, that well of, of uh, joy sometimes runs dry, we can always come back to God through the Spirit and we can find that joy that's, that's gone out, that fire that's gone out, it's been rekindled. So here's my main encouragement for you this morning. The main kind of point I want to I wanna bring forth. Christ alone rekindles our hearts with joy. Nothing that in society does that. None, none of the, the hymns we sing during, you know, not we sing, but that are sung during Christmas and the comfort and joy that's propagated by a culture. It's Christ alone that brings us real joy, lasting joy, joy that's good for us. So whether or not you consider your, yourself a joyful person or not, it's Christ who refuels our joy, and it's only thanks to his sacrifice that we have an eternal destiny to hope in. Let's pray. God, we lift up our voices in joy to you this morning by the goodness of your love to us. We thank you for the coming Messiah, for the Lord himself, who is destined to shepherd us and to rule us and to lead us to green pastures that are near to you. But we know what's even more important than his birth was his death and his resurrection, which gave us the joy of knowing that we can be together with you throughout all eternity. I pray this morning that you would remind us of that joy and kindle it in our hearts, not only this Advent season, but in the months and the years beyond that, every day of our lives. Remind us of all the ways that we can express joy in you for the incredible salvation that you've worked in us. And even in the dark times, help us to look to you with excitement, knowing that our eternal destiny is secure into you, in you. We come forward with gratitude in the name of the one true King, that of Jesus. Amen.